Say hi to somebody next to you, shake hands, high five, old religious nod, whatever you'd like to do. All right, just a couple of things here real quick. Um, if you're visiting with us today or first time in a long time, um, fill out this little connect card and hand it off when, on your way out in, in a little bit. We'll get out of here by noon or 1230. <clears throat> um, actually, it actually went pretty quick, first service. Uh, one time is not a trend, just so you know. Um, okay, so um, you get to sign up for Wednesday night meal. We're going to have a dinner on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. They're going to be doing Sloppy Joe's out in the coffee shop area. Sign up. Put your name on there. <clears throat> Let us know how many people you're bringing. And then at 7 o'clock, I'll do um, doing a little uh, group talking, teaching, uh, listening, conversation about the book of Revelation uh, in here starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, also, men's breakfast coming up next Saturday, 8 o'clock in the morning. Men, come on out for that. It's, they always do a great job. And um, baptism is next Sunday. So if you have not been baptized, I want to encourage you to sign up. Put your name on the card. Write baptism in there. We'll get with you this week and let you know what, what we do and how we do it. Uh, it's real simple. We'll do it during the uh, 10 o'clock service next Sunday. If you've been baptized and you've done stuff wrong, uh, come, come do it again. I'll hold you under a little bit longer <clears throat> and, uh, we'll teach you the real fear of the Lord. Uh, not, not really. That's just a joke. Uh, also prayer service will be next Sunday night from uh, 630 to 730. Uh, so be here, join us for that. If you can, um, happy new year. I don't know if there's something else I'm supposed to say. Oh, uh, if you need an outline, uh, raise your hand. If you don't have one, Jim's got some right there in the back. He'll bring them to you real quick. You got to have that outline or they don't let you out the door. <laughs> All filled out too. Okay, so New Year. And you know, Randy brought up the, the New Year's resolution thing. I'm not real big on that, but I did make one this year. And my New Year's resolution is I'm going to quit giving Randy such a hard time about being a KU fan. <clears throat> Just or, or now pray for him, shoot a little higher, you know, Razorbacks. Ooh, pig suey. Um, yeah, no, I, I think the beginning of the year is a good time for us to evaluate some things in life and, and take a look. And that's kind of what we as staff have been doing with, uh, with the church uh, and our, our mission, our vision for the uh, future. And it doesn't change a whole lot. But I'll be honest, I'm a little excited about some of the changes or some of the additions that we, that we have made. Uh, so we're going to talk about a church, this being a biblical church, a church with a mission, um, and, and it comes through a revelation of divine purpose. Matthew 5, 16 has been our key verse in this church for 20, almost 22 years now since Lisa and I got here. And it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I have a lot of information that goes along with that verse and maybe get into some more of that in the weeks to come. But um, <clears throat> I don't think there's a better way to describe what we are to do as believers and what we are to do as a church. God has given us his light, has he not? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Point to a you. Yeah, it's here. He's, he called us the light of the world. Um, so our mission is still the same. Let the light shine. Let the light of God shine through our life and everything that we do, wherever we go. And, you know, you, you, it's not hard to tell the people uh, that are letting their light shine versus the ones who are not. And like I said, with this being our, our mission <clears throat> Um, I'm, I'm more excited about it now than I ever have been quite possibly because of our staff that we have now and the leadership that we have in this church, um, and their contribution to the mission and the vision 
moving forward, uh, Pastor Shannon, Pastor Randy, Pastor Matt, uh, some of our council uh, members and, and leadership have added some fresh perspective to our vision. And, you know, times are changing, right? And sometimes you need, you need a different perspective on things. Uh, so I, I believe it's going to take us to a whole new level of, of uh, making disciples, uh, winning souls to Christ, having confidence and boldness to share your faith with somebody outside of the church. Um, you know, I don't know if you know it or not, but <clears throat> people want to know about God. They do. I mean, they may act like they don't. They may even say that they don't, but they do. But everybody deep down wants to know about God. I believe that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We just sang that, didn't we? Uh, all right, look in your outline. Hey, fulfilling God's purpose begins with a divine revelation. In Matthew chapter 16, many of you remember this story. Jesus said to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now there's a lot of information in these verses that have been argued over for years. Uh, was Peter the rock? What are the keys of the kingdom that he's talking about? What is this whole binding and loosing thing? And does that still apply? There, I mean, there's some good questions in there. But the only thing that I really want to be concerned with and, and deal with today is where Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, there's a, there's a lot of personal pronouns in there that we have to come to the realization that it's God, Jesus, builds his church. Okay, we can do our part and we can try and we can come up with some stuff and, and do some things different or better or whatever, but Jesus builds his church. But what was he talking about when he said, on this rock, I will build my church? I think Jesus was talking about the revelation of who Jesus is. Peter just throws it out there. He just, he, he, he acted like he was confident in his reply to Jesus. When Jesus said, who am I? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That listen, that is the dividing line between saved and lost heaven and hell. It is what makes the difference between just surviving in this world versus living with the peace and joy that only comes by the truth of who Jesus is. It's something we all have to come to realization of, and you need a divine revelation of it. You say, well, I've heard that my whole life. Yeah, but it's not going to mean a whole lot until you hear it from God. When you have a, a divine revelation, when you have a divine encounter with the son of the living God, it's going to change some things in life. All this time, the disciples had been walking with Jesus, seeing and hearing the truth and issues of the kingdom of God. And finally, someone hears the truth from God himself concerning who Jesus really is. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, yeah, but flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Peter. It was my father in heaven. That's the revelation. That's the rock on which Jesus is building his church. We, we need that kind of a revelation. That doesn't come from flesh and blood. I can stand up here all day long and talk about Jesus as our, our Savior. He's the one that died on the cross for our sins. He paid the ransom for, for, for everything. that you know, he, I could, We could just go on and on about what Jesus has done. But that's just flesh and blood. Until it actually comes to, through your spirit, the spirit of you, from the spirit of God in the form of a revelation, you're not going to totally get it. Now, I'm, not, I'm not talking about something weird here. I'm just saying we have to have this connection with God so that he can speak straight into our life. We all need a divine revelation from God. God is wanting to speak into our life, but if we don't hear it or if we don't make a response to it, we're still just guessing when it comes to the issues of eternal life. We, we need to know. We need to have that kind of relationship with God where we 
we're, we're there, right? Jesus is here. The, the Bible tells us that he's not only with us, but he's in us. The Holy Spirit has a ministry, has a work, has to do with, with my life, how I live, how I think, the things I do. The New Testament uses uh, some pretty descriptive images to show us what the church is like. Um, we, we are the church, the body of Christ. For example, it is described, it is described as a family into which we are born again. With God as our father and many brothers and sisters in the faith. The church is also described as a kingdom wherein we are citizens <clears throat> with Jesus Christ ruling as our king to whom we have an obligation to be completely submissive to. Uh, and, and other scripture talks about the church as a body emphasizing both unity and diversity. Each of us performing different roles with Jesus Christ as our head. Sorry, I had biscuits and gravy in between services. Did y'all get some of that? That's really good. Somebody go tell them to fix me a to-go plate. Would y'all, would y'all be offended if I had another one while I'm talking? <clears throat> You're going to get to hear the results of the first one. Anyway, I want to talk about the church. Okay, I mean, and, and you know, sometimes church things get funny with, with people. Well, you know, we don't go to that church. We don't like that church. We're not one of those. We're not, we don't do that. We don't do that. We're, we're you know, look, there's only one church. It is the body of Christ as a whole, and we need to be acting more like one. We, we do. These are brothers and sisters. And, and if they're going to a church that <clears throat> you wouldn't go to, doesn't mean you can't still love them, talk to them. It does not, does it? No, we're not, we're not in competition with other churches. We're, we're competing for the soul of man in all that we do. All right, so number one, in your outline, the biblical church is designed to grow. I, I believe this. I, I've always believed this. Jesus is the architect of the church, and he designed it to grow. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And, and, and you know... I think I've been doing ministry stuff for 35 years or so now. I'm, I'm 46, so no. No, I lost track of time. Anyway, I've gone to all these different church growth seminars. You've seen them and heard about them. And, you know, everybody's got a new fresh idea about how to get your church to grow, how to make it bigger. <clears throat> I've heard, I think I've heard it all. <clears throat> and there's some good information in some of those. There really is. I remember when that big deal came out about each one win one or each one invite one or each one saves one or whatever, where everybody in the church ought to have somebody that they're inviting to church or inviting to Christ. I mean, that's a good idea. That's what we should be doing naturally. That should come to us intuitively. You've got some great news. If you're saved, if Jesus has changed your life, you've got something good to share with people. You've got some good news. To keep that to yourself is almost selfish. Because people want to know the truth. You say, well, I don't know how to do all that. Just tell them your story. I was here. I am here. And this is how God got me here. This is a real simple story. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be theological. You just, just tell your story. People want to know. Um, I do like what Dr. George Westlake said uh, in his book. Uh, we are not in the business of production. As believers, as pastors, we're, we're not in the business of production. Our only job is distribution. And it's true. We can't make Christians. I can't make people be a Christian. I can't make people come to church. We can't force people to show up on Sunday morning. I mean, I have my ideas about how we might could. <clears throat> but, but we won't go there. Um, we're not, we're, we can't make people change. We can't be uh, producing in, in that sense. That's God's job. Our job is just distribution. We keep giving the word. And I've had this talk with staff over and over again, you know, cause you, after a while you get tired of doing the same stuff over again, over and over. I mean, it just, and, and it wears you down. It wears you out and you get to hear all of the, the problems and all the things that people don't like. 
And you know, you get to a point where you're just like, what's the use? But we have to make up our mind. We get up every morning and renew our commitment to Christ and our commitment to the ministry of the gospel. And we just keep giving it out. We just keep preaching. We keep teaching. We keep loving other people and trying to help those who are looking for help. And, and that's, that's what life is. That's what your life is. <clears throat> A lot of ideas out there about who the church is and, and what the church is. Uh, and I don't want to say that all the churches are getting it wrong and we're the only ones that are getting it right. We know that that's not true. Um, but I do want to say we have an obligation, each of us, all of us, to be a biblical church, to follow what God has put in his word. All other ideas of church and church, church growth will only lead to some type of a disaster down the road. We just keep following the word, keep teaching, keep preaching what, the word of God. That's all we got. That's all we got. One of the uh, misleading indicators of a good church is its size or its growth rate. A lot of people look at, you know, the big mega church and they say, well, they must, well, they must be good. That's a good church. Well, not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a biblical church. There's a lot of big buildings out there that house people that are not being biblical, but uh, that's not my, that's not my argument. That's not my place. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to criticize any of them. There's some that'd be easy to criticize though, isn't it? I got in that conversation the other day with somebody about a preacher. It, it, his, his opening line was, it's hard for me not to be critical about such and such. And I'm like, well, you know, we don't have to be. I, I've, I've seen good preachers come and go. You have too. Um, back when we only had 25 people coming to church on Sunday morning, it was kind of easy then to say, I don't think them big churches are doing it right. You know, they're not. That's not biblical. I actually had somebody tell me that your church should never be over 200 people. When it gets over 200 people, you should cut it in half, start over. I don't know what that means. <clears throat> never tried it. Don't want to. I believe if the priority of the church is being biblical, it should grow. Because now, now you're getting the, the favor and the help and the blessing of God the Father. Jesus said he's going to build his church. He can do it here. He can do it over there. He can do it down the street. He can do it in Baser if he wants to. Jesus can build his church anywhere he wants to. Our, our responsibility is to stay biblical. It's, it's not always guaranteed, though, that it's going to grow, especially in these last days where many people are more interested in themselves than they are the truth of God's word and, and biblical ideas. And, and more and more, I think we're going to see that. You know, the Bible talks about a falling away. I, I mean, but you know what? That's not our... It's just not our thing. We have to keep our focus on the word of God, be a biblical church, treat each other the way the Bible teaches us to treat each other. In the book of Acts, there's one verse that might give us a hint to the reality of growth in the first century church anyway. Acts chapter 9 verse 31 says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. So, so here's a couple of ideas that I get from that, that verse. And the first one is number two in your outline. It's the church will often grow in times of persecution. Um, the church, the first century church was persecuted, but it grew faster than anybody ever would have expected it to. <clears throat> but it says that in Acts 9.31 that the churches had rest. And it wasn't because they were done or, or that they had finished the work that God had given them to do. It was rest following the immense persecution of the church and the Christians in that day. The, you go back and read the first nine chapters of the book of Acts, and it's one trial for believers after another. Some of them had gotten beaten. Some of them were scourged. Some were thrown in prison. Uh, Stephen was stoned to death. I mean, all of this persecution was happening, but the church was on fire. I mean, it was growing. When, when we're doing the right things in our world that's gone wrong, there's going to be some persecution. There, there's going to be a little bit of kickback, some problems created by ungodly people. But even in the midst of that, God can bring us into a place of rest and a place of peace. And, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And I want you to think about this since it's the beginning of a new year. What are you going to let get you down? What are you going to let 
take over your thoughts? What are you going to let take over your attitude? Is it going to be little things like maybe it was for some last year? I'm telling you, God still has a place of peace and of rest, even in the middle of that. Philippians 4 and 9, the apostle Paul said, the things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will walk with you, even when things are difficult, even when things don't look right or don't feel right. You know, we can say that about our society these days. There's some stuff that just don't make any sense. But the God of peace will be with you if you'll make that decision um, to live like he says. The turning point for the Apostle Paul is when, you know, Saul of Tarsus had this encounter with Jesus. That's what I was talking about with the revelation of who Jesus is. The Apostle Paul saw it with his eyes. He, he saw it firsthand, and, and it changed his life radically. And I believe a revelation from God will too. And, and you know, if you're, if you're still uncomfortable with me saying it like that, a, a revelation of who Jesus is, spend some time just in prayer this week. Do it before the day is over. Chiefs, are the Chiefs playing today? Ah, who cares? I'm just kidding. What time? Noon? Oh, yeah, we'll probably be done. <clears throat> um, who are they playing? Are they still, they still have a football team in Denver? <laughs> I wasn't sure. How many of y'all watched the Razorbacks play KU in the Liberty Bowl? Really? Three of us? Four? How'd it turn out, Randy? I, I, no, my New Year's resolution is I'm not giving you a hard time anymore about KU. <laughs> <laughs> I actually texted him <clears throat> after the game was over. There was a little bit of time there. I wasn't sure who was going to win. And I asked Randy if he was going to really give me a hard time if KU had won. And I don't remember what you said, something snarky like, what are you still doing up? It's past <laughs> your bedtime. <clears throat> because if he would have said, yes, I was going to give you a hard time, then I was going to start giving him a hard time. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul the Apostle after he has an encounter with Jesus. And he gets, he gets to see what you and I can only see from a spiritual perspective. But a revelation of who Jesus is will so radically change who you are, if you'll let it, that you won't criticize KU fans anymore. That's my New Year's resolution. Write it down, Randy. <clears throat> this rest that he's talking about here is a place of, of God's favor and of God's peace. Um, rest is one of the promises of God in Christ Jesus, regardless of the circumstances that we have to face in this life. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He has promised us rest, rest. The promise of God is we can still have peace and, and rest, even in the midst of persecution and opposition. Uh, persecution and opposition does not create the church. Yeah, some people say, well, the church would just be way better if it was persecuted more. Persecution doesn't create the church, but it will define the church. How we handle it, how we go through uh, opposition and persecution. Um, there, there's a distinct connection between the rest we find in Christ and the church being multiplied like it was in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. We have to find that place of peace and rest in our relationship with Christ. What's that one verse in Philippians 1, I think, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain? I mean, that's like a whole different level of attitude, okay? I know there's bad things that are happening out here around us, but it doesn't have to control me. I can still live with the peace in the presence of Christ, and I can live in his rest that he offers. <clears throat> Romans 5, 1 reminds us of where we can also find that peace. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. It's going to take some faith 
for us to, to really live in that kind of peace, the peace of God. Um, <clears throat> Being your outline, church growth is limited to our willingness toward edification. The word edification is just an old English word meaning to build up, to encourage, or to support in the faith. Um, building others up does not require, it doesn't require a college degree or ministry con- credentials. It only requires a willingness to help someone else in their pursuit of God or their struggles with this life. What we see in the New Testament is a, is a constant cycle of doing for other people of those things which is, is for their good, for their spiritual growth, for their insight, their education, their spiritual health, and, and even meeting the physical needs of other people. That's all through the New Testament. The, the opposite effect to expect from not building up is tearing people down. The, the church has gotten a reputation over the years for just people don't want to, people don't want to go to church. Because we, we lost the ability or we lost the willingness to um, build other people up. Instead, you know, we just tell everybody what we don't like. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> I guess we're on Facebook, aren't we? I still got a really cool story. When my son was only about four or five years old, Lisa's not here, so I won't embarrass her. He was just a little bitty guy. My real dad from Arkansas had came up and stayed a couple of days. <clears throat> my dad would go out on the back porch and smoke cigarettes, you know. And he, he came back in, and my little son walks up to him. He said, do you smoke? And my dad said, yes. And he said, well, you're going to hell. <laughs> and I went, smack. No, I didn't. I don't know where he got that from. It was, I, we never said that. But that's kind of how the church has been. Well, you're going to hell. And we just, we just smugly point out the faults of everybody else. We even do that inside the church. And we're comfortable with that. When he says we should be building others up, if you're not building people up, you're tearing them down. Attitude, actions, words, you're tearing people down. If you ignore them because I'm, I'm, I'm so righteous and holy, I, I, I can't even look your way. You're, that's not building them up. Um, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 14, 26 is where the church at Corinth gets a little bit of correction from the apostle Paul. He said, how is it then brethren, when you come together, each of you has a plan, has a Psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, let all things be done instead through edification. And so what he was saying is everybody was coming to church and they just wanted their own ways like Burger King. You rule. That's, that's one of their new slogans, isn't it? You rule. I heard it last night. And then I drove down to Burger King. Well, they they look so good late at night. Uh, I didn't really drive down there. But the point is, is when everybody comes to church and they just want to do their own thing. Make me happy if you can. Do it my way. Uh, uh, You didn't sing the right songs. You should have sang my song. You you should have preached uh, my my sermon. You know, you, you should talk about. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. People come in. They just want what they want. And they expect you to give it to them. That's what was happening in Corinth. If the church comes together to do their own thing, just so that they can get their own way, it only causes conflict and a self-centered faith that doesn't make disciples. It actually gets in the way of making disciples. I mean, isn't that our goal? Is to not only see people come to Christ, but to help those people grow in their relationship with Christ. And if all we want is our way, my way, let's do this my way then we're, we're getting in the way of what God wants to do. We'll talk more about that later, how each of us have a part and a responsibility in the body of Christ. When we all come together, not for the purpose of doing our own thing, but for the purpose of building up one another. I mean, how, how often do you go out of your way to build somebody else up? Edification is the priority of all spiritual gifts. When, when, when the Bible talks about spiritual gifts or when I talk about spiritual gifts, the, the purpose of those spiritual gifts is to build people up, not tear them down, not, not to hurt them, not to wound them, to build them up, to build up the church as a whole. And it should be the priority of each of us individually. 
Romans 15, 1 says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. When, when is the, the last time or how often do you do things for other people that's only for their good, but you don't get anything out of it? You're just doing something to build them up. We talk about how strong we are as Christians, and we sometimes we, we make sure that everybody around us knows that I'm a strong Christian. I read my, I read my Bible every day. I pray. I, I have a, a cool bumper sticker that says Jesus saves. We, we got all these reasons why we're so spiritual and, and such good Christians, but <clears throat> how good are we really if we're not building somebody else up? I mean, it's, it's our responsibility. <clears throat> How often do you do things for other people um, to build them up? We, the church, are very good at spotting the weaknesses of other people. But how often do we get involved in bearing the if infirmities of other people? I mean, when's the last time you got close enough to somebody? You know that they're messed up. You know they got stuff in their life that you don't like. When's the last time you found somebody like that and you just went up to them and said, how can I help? What can I do? I see some great qualities in your life. You may not be doing it all right now, but I know you have some great qualities in your life. How can I help? I mean, it's just something we can do. <clears throat> I, I went to Sam's yesterday. That was brave, wasn't it? And there was a lady with a sign when I walked out. And you know, the easiest thing to do is just, you know, just keep on walking. And I, and I did. I I wasn't pushing a cart because I had taken something back, but um, I just kept walking. I didn't even read her sign. And I got in my truck and I thought, that's just wrong. Yeah, I don't know what she's got going on. I mean, I don't, but I do know that Jesus knows. And all I had, promise, all I had was 20 bucks because I was driving somebody else's vehicle. And, and so I, I gave the lady 20 bucks. I always carry a bunch of ones and a couple of fives in my, in my truck in the console. So if you ever need a couple of bucks, just go out to my truck and grab some. <clears throat> but didn't know the lady. And I know how some people look at that. They say, oh, she probably just went out and bought some cheap wine. That's not, my, that's not, that's not on me. I, I think I specifically remember the Bible telling us, give to every man that asks. And, you know, we can spare it, can't we? I mean, there's, there, there may not be one person that comes through this church on a Sunday morning that can't spare 20 bucks for somebody to go buy some food. Um, number one, church growth requires a healthy fear of the Lord. I kind of have this idea that if we're not helping those who are weak, then, then we're adding more hurt to the weak because they start getting an attitude about everybody, especially if they know that you're a church person. Well, church won't help. They're, they're all the same. They're just in it for themselves. <clears throat> Acts 9 31 says the church was multiplied and being built up partially because they were walking in the fear of the Lord. And I've used this verse recently. I'm going to use it again. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, and the evil way and the perverse, perverse mouth. God says, I hate. Now, <clears throat> we should hate what God hates, shouldn't we? If you really want to know what it means to be actively involved in the fear of the Lord, it, it means you hate what God hates but you love what God loves. Now, there's a whole lot of stuff that, that I could talk about here when it comes to the fear of the Lord, but the one thing that I had on my mind when I wrote this down was we are to hate sin because God hates sin. But if we're actually living in the fear of the Lord and we're understanding what he is trying to say to us, while we may hate sin, we do not hate sinners. It, and, and that's a line that has to be drawn. If you're going to really fear the Lord, yeah, you, you hate sin, but you do not hate sinners. We will never be able, uh, or never be all that we should be to the kingdom of God if we can't settle this contradiction in our soul and in our mind and our way of thinking. 
God does not want us to hate sinners. Now, there's times that we have to separate ourselves from sinners or, or we never want to be influenced by them or give in to their temptation. Jesus came into this world to save sinners, right? And then he commissioned each one of us to do the same thing. We have to make this distinction in our mind in the way that we think. Okay, I hate sin, but there's not a person that I hate. Even, even the worst of sinners, I refuse to go there. Jesus died. He demonstrated his love for us, all of us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love of God demonstrated through the death of his son on our behalf. But you have, you have to limit your exposure to this sinful world and at the same time maximize your exposure to the word of God and the person of Christ. That's how we keep a healthy hatred for sin and a divine love for sinners. If you get that balance right, it will change the way you walk in this world. It'll, it'll change so much about your life. It's, it's what it means to live in the fear of the Lord. I hate what God hates, but I love what God loves. Number two, growing is part of demonstrating divine peace. Uh, this is true for each of us individually, individually, but also we as the church. Acts 9.31, the church multiplied because they were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. This comfort of the Holy Spirit brings an, a whole new level of confidence um, in troubled times. You, you know what? If we had that, if, if we would let the Holy Spirit really work in us, that we would have peace even in the middle of the troubles that we have to face. That we, we would, we, there's something on the inside of us that is, is confident that God is still at work here. God is still doing some things. It may be rough where I'm at right now, but God's still in charge. I'm going to make it through. It, it'll give you a whole new level of confidence in troubled times. But it'll also give you a, a peace that is built on the assurance of God's care assurance just kept coming up in my mind this morning. I was just thinking, you know, I, people are full of doubt these days. They're just not sure. They're not convinced. They're certainly not confident. It, it's, it's like everything is a, is a if type question. I hope I'm doing okay. If I do better, maybe I can, I mean, it's, it's just the assurance is gone, but, but God, will give you peace in such a way that will restore assurance that God not only cares for you, but that God is working some things out for your good. Churches don't grow when they create an environment of chaos or worry. If we come together each week and all we talk about are the things in this world that we don't like, things that we're afraid of, how bad this world is or, or how this world is, is doomed, it doesn't build anybody up. Right? I mean, I mean, think about it. You've heard these conversations in the halls, even here in this church, where <clears throat> something on the news, you know, they're talking about missiles in Russia again and Kiev or, or Korkiev. Uh, yeah, I mean, people, uh, and, and it's, I get it. I mean, people talk about that sort of stuff, but that's not building anybody up. But when you go, and you, that's all you hear that's not, that's not even biblical. We, we should have a, a word of, of testimony on our lips. We should have a word of encouragement. We should be able to build other people up. There are things in scripture that we should learn and know that we can share when we come in. Yeah, uh, what is it Spencer always say? I always ask Spencer Clark, how you doing? How you doing, Spencer? Oh, I'm doing good, but, I, but it's getting better. That's what, he, that's what he always says. I think that's okay. You know, there's just some things we can do to encourage people around us. Not just, you know, tell them how bad, well, I got sick last week. Threw up on my brand new bedspread. Rough, rough week. Um, if we say we have faith in God and trust in Christ, why would we live and, and constantly rehearse all of the problems and the fears of this world? That's not what Jesus did. That's not what he had in mind in John 14, 27, when he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, 
give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let's put some of that stuff out of our mind. You say, well, you can't hide from it. No, you can't hide from it. I'm not saying act like it doesn't exist. I'm just saying you have better news to share with other people. You can still build people up even when things are bad around us. You know, guess what? April is coming. April 15 to be exact. And you can let that ruin the next three months for you if you want to. I know I ain't happy about it. But it's a reality I have to face. But I have so many other great things and good things happening. And God is, God is great. <clears throat> I'll make it through another April 15th just like you will. If we're going to be a church that grows and multiplies, we, we must be a biblical church, a church that builds up and not tears down, a church that hates sin but loves sinners. Number three, a healthy church is one who believes in the Holy Spirit. We, we must also be a church that believes in, we sang it in that song, and leans on the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, this world has taught us in so many ways. that we don't, A lot of people don't even like talking about the Holy Spirit. And don't dare call him the Holy Ghost. We don't, we don't talk about that in our church. Well, you're missing out on something. Because it is, it is part of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is not a it, it's a he. It's a, it's a person. It's a, it's a part of the Godhead. And, and we have so much instruction on what the Holy Spirit sh should be doing in our life. Um, the Holy Spirit is our only hope. For doing what Jesus said we must do for the kingdom of God and for lost people. John 16, 7, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Okay, comforter means the one that walks beside. It's the parakletos in Greek. But Jesus was saying, you're, you're better off with the Holy Spirit being here than you are with me being here in person. Because Jesus in, in the flesh in that, in that moment of time could not be everywhere at the same time. But the Holy Spirit can. And he can work in your life. He's convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's at work in people um, that you know that are not believers. He's already at work in their life. Convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, if, if that's true... They're, they're not going to be surprised if you start talking to them about Jesus. I believe it's true. I've watched it. I've, I've seen this thing happen over and over again. <clears throat> Jesus says it's better that he goes away. It was the Holy Spirit working in us that brought us to salvation and repentance. He also teaches us how to understand and apply God's word. Jesus said in John 14, 26, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. Basically, the Holy Spirit working in you is, is reminding you of what you know, what you've read, what you've seen in the Bible. I mean, he's there to, to uh, exalt Jesus. But have you ever gotten into those conversations with people and, and, you, just, and you just go blank? I don't, I don't even know what to say, you know? Or you're like me and, you know, 15 minutes later after the conversation is over, oh, I should have said that. You know, if you'll give the Holy Spirit an opportunity, he will remind you of things that Jesus has said. He will help you in those moments. And I look, I've, 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 I've seen this more times than I can even describe where God in the moment just gives the right words based on scripture. It's not stuff I make up. He just gives the right words for a good outcome. Now, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And he wants to do that in all of us. But you, you, you can't bounce back and forth, right? I mean, it, it needs to be a commitment one way. Um, I know some churches just avoid talking about the Holy Spirit, but the truth is there's no comfort apart from the presence of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Here's the last one. We as a church should shine in this world. Matthew five sixteen. let your light so shine, therefore... Uh, before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. N not just the church that should, s should shine each of us individually, 
and this might be our mission statement, uh, uh, but listen, it is all of our responsibility. Didn't Jesus say, you are the light of the world? You are the light. <clears throat> um, when Lisa and I first came to Tonganoxie, it was, it's almost been 21 uh, years or one years or 22 years, whatever it was. It was 2002 when we came here, so 20, almost 21 years. Um, I, if God's ever spoken to me, it was in that, that moment that God spoke. It, it was, can, can you call it a revelation? I, I think there's been times where God has given things to me in a moment's time that I couldn't have made up on my own in a year. But this was one of those times. I was praying. I just wanted to know, God, what can, what can we do in this community to make a difference for the kingdom of God? And that verse came into my mind, and, and I started thinking about it. And, you know, to be honest with you, when the first time I read it, um, in my mind, I could see it all laid out. I could see the, the lighthouse set up on a hill, uh, in the dark with beams of light shining out, showing people the, the way, the right way, the safe way. Um, I, the, I wrote down the word shine and immediately this acrostic came to me. And I, I know we had one of our, Jane helped me with one of the words. And she gave me a better word to use, but you know, it was just like God put it all together in just that moment. We're going to keep this idea of <clears throat> let the light shine but I'm telling you, we've got some really good stuff um, to go along with that. We're not trying to make everybody in here the same, but we are trying to make everybody in here one. We want, we want to be the church that is a biblical church that God is able to use to do great and wonderful things in this community and beyond so that God would be glorified. Not, it's not about any of us. Um, but as I, I, I watch some of the things that have happened <clears throat> over the years, we can't quit. We can't, we can't be done. Let's not stop. Hard times, tough things, yeah, they're going to happen. But we can count on God to get us through successfully, victoriously, and, and for the good of his kingdom. And I think that's what we're, we're headed toward. Uh, I, I said a little bit of it in the beginning of this message that I think that along with our, our staff, <clears throat> we're, we're going we're gonna to be able to elevate the church and its mission to a whole different level. Um, Pastor Shannon, Pastor Randy, Pastor Matt, along with some council members and a host of volunteers, we're going we're gonna to do a volunteer appreciation banquet I think in February. So if you volunteer anywhere in the building, uh, you're going to be invited to come to a banquet where we're going to really spoil, spoil you, um, pamper you. Um, but they've added some fresh perspective to a vision statement, a mission statement that we've had for 20 years. And I'm looking forward to how, uh, how it goes, and I'm looking forward to sharing uh, that with you in, in the weeks to come and throughout the next year. Um, God's still at work. We're not done. So let's all stand together and we'll just close in a word of prayer. <clears throat> just bow your heads if you would for just a minute. And you know what? You may, you may think, well, that's, that's all good and fine for the church. I really, it, it's all for each of us individually to come to the place where we allow God's influence in our life in such a strong way that other people around us can't help but get a little bit of Jesus splashed on them it's out of the overflow of our life I want that for you for each of you to know something about this great peace and rest that God gives even when the rest of the world is falling apart. You almost feel guilty for not being worried about it like everybody else seems to be. But God's got a greater plan. 
And, and I believe it starts with purpose in each of our lives individually. And then God builds that into the church that he wants. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. <clears throat> we are the church. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are strong enough to influence each one of us individually and us as a church. We surrender to you today. At the beginning of a new year, we ask that you would just move into the darkness of our hearts and our minds. Help us to get a vision, a, a, a desire to build one another up and not tear down. Give us, God, the wisdom not to just talk about the things we don't like in this world, but to speak your word, to speak hope and healing into the lives of other people, to encourage them for your kingdom's sake. We honor you and we bless you. We ask you to be Lord of our life right here, right now but also in this year to come, show yourself strong in each of us individually and in this church. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand if you would before you go. God bless you all, love you.